It is my pleasure to welcome you to Northern Kentucky History Hour. I am your host for tonight, Mary Jane Calderon, joining you from my home in Fort Wright, Kentucky. Also joining me by the power of Zoom is Heather Cook from her dorm in Worcester, Ohio, and our presenter for this evening, Peter Bronson from his home in Milford, Ohio. Thank you both for being here. Northern Kentucky History Hour is a project of Beringer Crawford Museum, Northern Kentucky's History Museum, that would not be possible without support. Thank you to all of our sponsors, including the City of Covington, Kenton County Fiscal Court, ArtsWave, Kentucky Arts Council, Northern Kentucky Sports Hall of Fame, the Carol Ann and Ralph V. Hale Jr. Foundation, and our members. If you're not yet a member of the museum, please consider joining for access to discounts and exclusive programming. Learn more and join at bcmuseum.org. We would love to hear from our viewers tonight. So if you have a question or comment to share, please type it in the chat or Q&A feature, and I will be sure to get to those at the end of the presentation. Let's meet tonight's presenter. Peter Bronson is a newsman, editor, magazine writer, author, and owner of Chili Dog Press Publishing. He has written eight books, including The Man Who Saved Cincinnati, Not in Our Town, and Forbidden Fruit. He started his career in Michigan after graduating from Michigan State University in his hometown of East Lansing, Michigan. Then he was an editorial page editor and columnist at the Tucson Citizen in Tucson, Arizona. He came to Cincinnati in 1992 and was an editor and columnist for the Cincinnati Enquirer for nearly 20 years. He has served on several nonprofits and was a regular panelist producer on the Channel 9 WCPO TV show, Hot Seat, and also on the weekly Tucson news show, Arizona Illustrated. He is the father of two and lives with his wife, Kathy, in Milford, Ohio. Now, before we get started, there is a quiz question tonight. The first respondent to enter a correct answer in the chat on Zoom or Facebook Live wins a Northern Kentucky History Hour prize. And most importantly, bragging rights. So tonight's question is, who was the doctor at Camp Denison in Cincinnati who became a household name in America and why? So go ahead and leave those answers in the chat. And then Peter, if you are ready, we'll stop sharing our screen and you can share yours and we'll get started. That sounds great, I'm on the way. Here we go. Great. Well, thank you for that uh, kind introduction and I'm glad to be here with you. Uh, it's been a while since I've been with the Beringer Crawford uh, crowd, but I've always enjoyed it. This was a really fun book to research and write. I had so much fun with it, I, and I hope you have as much fun reading. Uh, on the cover here, we show uh, the scenes of the Siege of Cincinnati, as it was known in 1862, when the Confederates sent an army of 10,000 men to take undefended, unprotected Cincinnati. Uh, the city had been torn by riots that summer. It was panicked. The mayor, who was a copperhead Southern sympathizer named George Hatch, he in fact wanted to surrender and had met with the mayors of Covington and Newport and they had agreed that when the Confederates showed up, they would wave the white flag and surrender the city. Uh, but this man named General Lou Wallace showed up just in time to save Cincinnati. He, uh, during his efforts to save Cincinnati, which in three days he formed the defenses that protected the city. He um, also was part, he was involved in creating the first bridge across the Ohio River, which is shown on the cover of the book, which was made from uh, coal barges that they recovered from the Licking River and lashed together and then planked. And that was the first bridge. And that's how they managed to get all the troops that were necessary across the river into rifle pits and cannon batteries to protect the city. Lou Wallace had an unbelievable career. He formed the first Black Brigade in the Civil War here in Cincinnati. He saved Washington, D.C. from attack when nobody else believed that it was even a, a problem. Uh, he was outnumbered two to one in the Battle of Monocacy against Jubal Early, who had launched a surprise attack on D.C. Yet he uh, held off Jubal Early's Confederates just long enough for Washington, D.C. to to save itself, just as he did in Cincinnati. Uh, in fact, he, he went out there to defend Washington, D.C. because he said he couldn't sleep 
because of nightmares of seeing Abraham Lincoln dragged out of the White House and the Confederates kicked down the door. He also sentenced the assassins of Abraham Lincoln and was one of the military officers who presided over their trial. He uh, captured Billy the Kid when he was a territorial governor of New Mexico. And among many other things, he wrote an American classic that is still a great read today called Ben-Hur, A Tale of the Christ. Lou Wallace and the story really begin at the Battle of Shiloh, which happened on April 6th and 7th, 1862. Up until then, there had never been a battle like this. Uh, troops were brought in on 30-day or 90-day enlistments. Everybody assumed that the war would be over in a matter of weeks, and months were out of the question. So when, uh, when the South uh, congregated in Corinth, Mississippi, uh, U.S. Grant was sent down to uh, Pittsburgh Landing at, at a place called Shiloh, which was named after a little church there. And uh, his troops were in place, and the Confederates came up. There were about 44,000 on each side. Grant was caught completely by surprise. In fact, when the, the Confederates attacked, he was seven miles away in Savannah, uh, Tennessee. And he was, um, had not reviewed his troops, had not paid any attention to how they were placed. He had put the most green, unbattle-tested troops possible out in the front lines. It was a total um, blow-up by Grant and his officers. In fact, they um, acknowledged later, Sherman admitted that for the first three years of the war, we were students and we didn't become real generals until the fourth year. Grant was thoroughly whipped on the first day. The Confederates rolled his troops back. And uh, but he showed his future potential when he rallied them on the second day and did the same thing to the Confederates. The very sad part of this is that so many young men died while these men were learning their craft. There were almost 25,000 casualties. Those men who were wounded, often severely, um, which owes to the ordinance that was used, it was a uh, subsonic round, a very heavy lead round that was fired from a 60 caliber rifle, rifled musket. And these things uh, didn't go uh, through a bone as modern um, uh, ordnance would. Instead, they would hit the body and if they hit you in a limb, they would shatter the bone and splinter it. And that would cause so, so much massive tissue damage that uh, amputations were the only choice to save most of these casualties. If they were shot in the uh, stomach, they were just, they were goners. If shot in the head, they had nothing to do. They either lived or they didn't. So these 25,000 casualties were left on the battlefield. And uh, it was actually Cincinnati who sent help in the form of the uh, Sanitation Committee of Hamilton County, which was a forerunner of what we now know as the Red Cross. And they sent steamboats down to the battlefield when the smoke had cleared to help these men clean them off the, pick them up and move them off the battlefield where they laid in the mud and bring them back to Camp Denison, which was then a boot camp, which they turned into a field hospital where many of the victims of Shiloh uh, would not have lived if not for Cincinnati and Camp Denison. It was the biggest battle of the war so far, and that number of casualties was incredible to people. It shocked the whole nation, north and south. And the, the story of Lou Wallace, let's get to that, was that he was left miles and miles behind the front lines where uh, Sherman and Grant had posted him. Uh, he was um, ordered to stay back there in case the Confederates looped around and tried to flank the Union Army. Well, General Grant um, made so many mistakes in this battle, but one of the greatest was not to bring forward Lew Wallace's third division on that first day. Had he done so, he would have arrived in place to reinforce Sherman in the center and probably sweep the Confederates off the field, thereby preventing a second day of battle and perhaps reducing the number of casualties by that. Instead, 
General Grant sent confused and unwritten verbal orders uh, via one of his aides. And those orders have been lost on the battlefield. Uh, we don't know exactly what they said, but they sent him down one road. And when he was almost on the battlefield, one of uh, Grant's aides rode out and told him to turn around, retrace his steps, go through a swamp with his cannons, and then show up on the left flank instead of on the right flank. Which, was, which meant that Wallace didn't arrive, uh, despite his valiant efforts, he didn't arrive till evening when the battle was over. Now, it's, it's important to remember also that Sherman and Grant were West Pointers, and the West Point was still very new. Uh, there were no really professional soldiers to speak of uh, in America at the time. We had a tradition of being citizen militias, but the West Pointers were trying to form that professional army, and they were very protective and defensive of their West Point society of graduates. Grant uh, was not a great student at West Point. Sherman was pretty good. Uh, Lou Wallace was not a West Pointer, and therefore he was excluded from that, that clique. And um, in many ways, they um, shunned him or found ways to, to put the self-taught generals like Lou Wallace behind the lines where they could do less damage, or so they thought. As it turned out, Lou Wallace, for a self-taught general, was remarkably uh, good at battlefield tactics. His units had the least casualties and greatest uh, battlefield success of any during the Battle of Shiloh. When those men were injured, this is what they would expect to confront in a surgeon's tent. Uh, this has been known as the dark ages of medicine because a surgeon was not somebody who had a medical degree. That was unknown. Uh, to be a surgeon, all you needed was a strong stomach and a willingness to take off limbs and to endure a lot of um, agony by your patients and gore. They used tools like these. They were so feared by the soldiers that many soldiers would keep a, a small pistol in their boot so that they could shoot the surgeon before he got to work on them. And surgeons knew better than to ever get near the battlefield because often they would be shot at any chance that the troops had to uh, take out a surgeon. It was such a bad time of medicine. Uh, sanitation, germs, uh, hygiene, none of this was known. So surgeons would routinely sharpen or hone their knives on the soles of their boots before they used them on a patient. Uh, bandages were often scarce in battlefield situations. And what they would sometimes do is take bandages from a man who had just died of gangrene, for example, and then take that bandage that is infected and put it on the man who's just had his arm or leg amputated. It was uh, a very, um, very hazardous time for a soldier who was wounded. So where, where is Cincinnati during all this? Cincinnati at the time was the sixth largest city in the USA. It's hard to imagine this today, but we were twice as big as Chicago, four times bigger than San Francisco. We had stockpiles of weapons, everything that the South needed, blankets, horses, mules, shoes, food, and lots of gold. The South desperately needed all of this to maintain their fight in the summer and, and fall of 1862. And the South also knew because they were on a roll, they were coming up through Kentucky <clears throat> and they had taken, they won the Battle of Richmond, they had taken Lexington and they took Frankfurt and they raised the Confederate flag over Frankfurt and installed a Confederate governor very briefly. But they were on a roll and they knew that if they could take Kentucky, if they could take Cincinnati, then Kentucky would fall to the south. And that it was also the gateway to the north. So if they took Cincinnati, they would cut the Union almost in half and it would break the Union. And um, if things fell the way they expected, the Union would be forced to sue for peace and would uh, eventually then um, we would have two countries, not one, and the South would get what they wanted, which was to be left alone with their uh, economy based on slavery. 
to get an idea of how important Cincinnati was, there are 41 Civil War generals buried in Spring Grove Cemetery. On the left, this monument is a uh, is for the, the grave of uh, General William Lytle, who is from a very well-known, uh, famous family. We, we've heard of Lytle Place, for example, on the river in Cincinnati. And uh, that is a spectacular monument. It uh, has a bronze relief that shows him being shot at the Battle of Chickamauga, where he died. On the other hand, probably the most um, daring and uh, courageous and successful general among all of those 41 in Spring Grove was Manning Ferguson Force. He is, uh, can be found, and you have to look very carefully or you will miss it, only by this little disc, like the size of a turkey platter in the ground at Spring Grove. Manning Ferguson Force was the only one of these generals who won the Congressional Medal of Honor during the Civil War. He did that. Here he is uh, by um, getting shot in the face during one of the campaigns. He was at Shiloh in Lew Wallace's division where he fought valiantly. He was then shot in the face during the campaign in Atlanta where he was left for dead. He went home to Cincinnati, uh, recovered, and then went back into the battle. And that's where he won the, the Medal of Honor. He uh, led the 20th Volunteer Infantry of Ohio. Uh, he was... Um, awarded the Medal of Honor. He was a Superior Court Judge in Cincinnati and Hamilton County. And then in his retirement, he formed and led the Soldiers and Sailors Home in Northern Ohio that ministered to uh, victims of Civil War battlefield wounds like he was. He was just an outstanding man. And also one of the early members of the Cincinnati Literary Club. And so that he left behind some great writings about the Civil War that I used in the book. And they are just uh, very vivid descriptions of these battles that he was in. The Cincinnati Literary Club, it may sound um, odd today to think of the literary club poets and, and um, readers of literature being these, uh, these courageous, valiant Civil War generals, but they were. This, the Literary Club uh, formed the Burnett Rifles, which was one of the key militias that helped defend Cincinnati. And they contributed lots of Civil War generals and officers, including a future president, Rutherford B. Hayes. Here we see another who is in uh, one of the, uh, what I would call the Hall of Fame for Cincinnati generals who fought at Shiloh and through the Civil War, Andrew Hickenlooper. It was his battery uh, called Hickenlooper's Battery of Cannons in the hornet's nest, which really saved the day and kept Grant from being completely overrun on the first day. The hornet's nest was where a group of Union soldiers made their last stand and the Confederates tried and tried and tried again to dislodge them and they couldn't until late in the afternoon when they lined up more than 60 cannons it was considered the largest barrage by cannons ever seen on the American continent. And that's what they did to finally blow these guys out of Hickenlooper's battery. Hickenlooper came home. He became a U.S. Marshal. He helped found Cincinnati Gas and Coal, which became Cincinnati Gas and Electric, and then Duke Energy. And he became Lieutenant Governor of Ohio, another of these giants of the Civil War. Now let's talk about the Confederates. On the right here is John Hunt Morgan, who uh, became known as Morgan's Raiders. He was an unbelievable cavalryman. And his raid, which is depicted there by the red line on the map of Kentucky and Cincinnati, was, is still today holds the record as the longest continuous cavalry ride ever in history, including Europe, and the USA and all other continents. He um, rode for days to the point where the men were falling asleep and falling out of the saddle and horses died under the riders. Wherever he could, he stopped and stole and swapped horses. He had, uh, he had terrorized Cincinnati to the point where people were putting their horses, horses in their houses and putting up signs pretending to have a plague or um, cholera or something to keep him from coming in. And uh, the whole city was panicked by John Hunt Morgan. He was a, an amazing character. General Henry Heath on the left 
was part of a force that was led by General Kirby Smith. And they were the ones who came up through Richmond and took Lexington. General Heath was an amazing guy. He was a West Point uh, graduate, but only by uh, his fingernails. He probably would have been thrown out of West Point if he had stayed another week. But he was, he did graduate from West Point. He was uh, loathed by his um, instructors and loved by his cadets. His fellow cadets loved him because he was such a hell raiser. He did uh, the craziest pranks. He was also an amazing athlete and a tremendous horseman. He, um, he was stationed after West Point. He was sent to Fort Atkinson in Kansas, what we now know as Kansas, and then was only known as Indian Territory. The soldiers there, only 80 of them under his command, knew it as Fort Sod because there was no lumber anywhere within 300 miles. So they had to build their entire fort out of Sod. Uh, he was surrounded by thousands of Plains Indians, gophers, snakes, and locusts. And uh, he commanded these troops. He resolved at one point as a way of being um, diplomatic with the Indians around him that he would go on a buffalo hunt with the Apaches and Comanches. He um, climbed aboard an Indian pony with nothing but a breech cloth. He had done uh, uh, just a um, bow and arrow, no musket, no rifle, no pistol. And he went off on this buffalo hunt. And he said that uh, this is a man who wrote his memoirs after being through many of the major battles of the Civil War, including Gettysburg, and where he was severely wounded. And he said in his memoir, that the buffalo hunt was the hardest thing I've ever done. He said that actually after um, firing 100 arrows, he finally killed a sick buffalo. And uh, so he was quite the daredevil. This is the man who was sent to take Cincinnati. He went to his commander, Kirby Smith, in Lexington, and he said, Cincinnati is undefended. They have no army. They have no cannons. They have nothing. Uh, they're sitting there like a ripe apple on a low branch, and I can take them. Will you give me permission? And Kirby Smith said, absolutely. I'll give you 10,000 men. Go take Cincinnati. So he marched north. This spread panic far and wide through Cincinnati. Uh, people were already somewhat terrorized by Morgan's Raiders the previous summer, and they would be again that next year. But uh, this was the end for Cincinnati. People were uh, shocked and they knew that uh, there was no way to defend the city. So what happened though, is just as the city was on the brink of uh, surrender, Lou Wallace showed up, got off the train and said, that's the end of that. I am declaring martial law. From here on, I am in charge, not the mayor of Cincinnati, not the mayor of Newport or Covington, and I will defend the city. People said, well, how can you do that? You have nothing. He said, I will make Cincinnati defend itself. Every man will carry a gun or a shovel, and we will defend the city. It was truly inspiring because every uh, person in Cincinnati, regardless of their wealth, their status, their ethnicity, their religion, their position in society, Everybody rolled up their sleeves, went across the river, and dug rifle pits and cannon batteries and defended the city. They also sent out a call statewide in Ohio and Indiana, and that brought thousands of volunteers. During this period, the mayor of Cincinnati, George Hatch, decided this was his opportunity to flex his muscle, and he sent his police out with bayonets to round up every free black man in Cincinnati and at the point of bayonets, these men were marched across this bridge from free Cincinnati into the slave state of Kentucky. Anybody that found them there could seize them as unclaimed property and sell them into slavery. This was um, horrifying to them. 300 were marched across that bridge and worked like slaves for about two days or a day and a half until Wallace heard about it. He put a stop to it immediately, and he sent one of his top commanders across the river to round them all up. He brought them back to Cincinnati, and uh, they were told that we would love to have you volunteer, but we know how you've been mistreated. We're not going to let that happen again, but we really need your help to defend the city. 
Uh, 300 men went home that night, and much to the surprise of everybody in Cincinnati, 700 showed up the next day, and they marched across the bridge again under this flag for the Black Brigade of Cincinnati. This was the first time that free Black men were given the chance to participate in the defense of an American city during the Civil War. It was the first time they were given any opportunity to help in their fight for freedom for all those uh, brothers and sisters who were held in slavery in the South. So they joined the first Black Brigade and uh, the rest is history. It was an amazing and ins inspiring chapter in our history. In fact, when the siege was lifted and they marched back across the river into Cincinnati, the crowds cheered them just as enthusiastically as it cheered all the rest of the volunteers and they had participated in the defense of Cincinnati. This is a, a picture of the squirrel hunters as many of those volunteers were known. They were backwoodsmen all through Cincinnati, Indiana, all the neighboring states, and they came by the thousands. They um, gave Wallace a numerical superiority but they also had antiquated weapons. These were uh, flintlocks, Kentucky rifles that they used, and they were very good shots. They got the name Squirrel Hunters because they said, one squirrel, one shot. So uh, they were great with one shot, but Wallace had nightmares that none of these men that were defending Cincinnati had ever seen a bullet fly. They had never uh, seen anything like cannon fire and he had seen men run at Shiloh. He knew what could happen in a route. And he had nightmares of them being choked and crowded against this pontoon bridge and uh, being drowning in the river or being um, shot like uh, fish in a barrel by the Confederates. So he was um, very well aware that this was not an impregnable defense. Here's what the defense looked like. The picture on the right is cannons on Mount Adams that were placed there to uh, defend the river crossing. The, uh, in the river down below, you see the gunboats that patrolled the river. And on the left, you see the yellow line, the yellow uh, marker indicates the cannon batteries. There was a string of seven miles of cannons, batteries, and rifle pits that was like a necklace across Northern Kentucky. And then up there at, the, at West Price Hill, on Price Hill, there was a cannon battery, and then again at Mount Adams. And Henry Heath and his Confederates got as far as Fort Mitchell. When he did get to Fort Mitchell, let's go back to that slide for a moment. The legend has it that he was on top of a house with his field glasses, looking at the defenses that Lou Wallace had erected. <laughs> it was his first look at these defenses and he had 10,000 battle-hardened Confederate soldiers eager for a fight at his back. Meanwhile, on one of the batteries up there along that um, line of defense was Lou Wallace, also with a pair of field glasses, looking south, and he saw Henry Heath on that rooftop. They looked at each other, and that was the show. So according to Lou Wallace, that was all it took. Henry Heath saw the defenses that he had erected, and uh, decided it was uh, impossible or not worth the losses, turned around and went home. Henry Heath told a very different story. According to Henry Heath, what happened was he, at the very moment that he was about to launch his attack on Cincinnati, a rider came in with orders from General Braxton Bragg through Kirby Smith, ordering him back to Lexington. The reason was that General Bragg was uh, expecting a big battle at Louisville against the Union General Don Carlos Buell. As it turned out, there was no battle in Louisville. Both generals never missed an opportunity to hesitate. General Bragg was um, very enthusiastically disliked by his troops and his commanders. He many times squandered chances for victory, and this is probably one of them. He was nervous, he was outnumbered, but he had no idea just how nervous and worried Don Carlos Buell was. In fact, Carlos Buell, uh, General Buell often exaggerated the Confederate strength to ridiculous proportions as an excuse to avoid combat. 
Both were veterans of Shiloh, so let's keep that in mind. They had ordered ranks and ranks of young men to march into the slaughterhouse of Shiloh, and no doubt they had post-traumatic battle uh, syndrome, and they probably were very reluctant to do that kind of thing again. However, the truth is Henry Heath was ordered back. He was sent down to uh, Lexington. The battle uh, for Louisville never did take place, but the opportunity to take Cincinnati was lost. Some interesting chapters along the way. Um, in, in Cincinnati and in, uh, Dayton, there was a famous copperhead by the name of U.S. Representative Clement Vallandig. He was a copperhead. He was a Southern sympathizer, and uh, he used his rights under the First Amendment as a U.S. congressman to give speeches against the war. Well, Lincoln and, and his commander in Cincinnati, General Ambrose Burnside, finally had enough of this. They sent federal troops to his house in Dayton broke down the door with axes and hauled him into the street in pajamas where they put him under arrest as a federal prisoner under the military code where he had no civil rights, threw him in prison. And then finally, when Lincoln was embarrassed by all of this, they sent him off to the South and turned him over as a prisoner to the South, uh, I guess under the uh, assumption that if you uh, like the South so much, why don't you try moving there? Lottie Moon was a wild, uh, scandal-plagued woman from Oxford, Ohio. She and her sister, Ginny Moon, she was engaged 18 times, uh, and one of her engagement victims was General Ambrose Burnside. Before the war, he got to the altar with Ginny and with, pardon me, with Lottie Moon, and just as it came time to say, I do, she said, no, Sri Bob, I don't, walked out. She eventually was married, and according to the story in the newspapers at the time, her husband held a gun on her and said, there will be a wedding or a funeral today. It's up to you. Lottie Moon was such a character, but guess what? She was also a Confederate spy. Burnside found out about this, had her arrested as a spy, and sentenced her to house arrest at uh, the, the Burnett House Hotel in Cincinnati, which was the luxury hotel of Cincinnati. It also happened to be his headquarters. So where else are you going to find Billy the Kid, Billy the Kid, Geronimo, and Ben-Hur all together? Well, you can find them in my book. You can find them in the life of Lou Wallace. And you can also find them at his museum and study, which is in Crawfordsville, Indiana, about three hours west of Cincinnati. This building on the lower right is one that he designed and built. He built it in the uh, near the turn of the century around 1900 and it is filled with fantastic um, inventions and engineering that didn't come along for most um, construction and architecture for a decade or more later. He also adorned it at the top of the eave there in the front with this sculpture of Ben-Hur as he imagined Ben-Hur, which is a great picture of Ben-Hur, I think. Uh, it's not Charlton Heston, but it's pretty cool. Uh, the, the men down on the left are Geronimo and his posse. Not only did Lou Wallace as territorial governor of New Mexico uh, capture Billy the Kid and end the bloody Lincoln County Range War, which is a model for all of the range wars of cattlemen versus settlers and uh, in all of the Westerns, but he also put down and stopped the bloody Indian attacks by Geronimo, who had uh, attacked and captured, kidnapped, or slaughtered uh, hundreds of people on the, in, the, in New Mexico at the time. And uh, for all of this, he also became a great inventor. He um, was a fantastic writer. Ben-Hur, not only was that uh, the best-selling book next to the Bible for many decades, it became a stage play that was the most popular stage play of its time. And perhaps one of the reasons was that they had a chariot race using live horses on stage. Ben-Hur was written by Lou Wallace because he uh, had been on a train and was seated next to a uh, nationally known atheist who uh, began to grill him about what he knew about the Bible and what was true and false. 
Lou Wallace said in his memoirs that he was so embarrassed by his lack of knowledge about the Bible that he resolved thereupon at that moment that he would educate himself about the Bible. And his study of the Bible eventually turned into his book, Ben-Hur, which is subtitled, A Tale of the Christ. Now, if you look closely in this picture of his study in museum, you'll see over there to the bottom left, just before we get to the edge of the Geronimo picture, there's a statue of the Wallace. That statue is there because there was a huge spreading beech tree right at that spot. And that's where he liked to do his writing. He invented his own writing desk that he put under the beech tree. And that's where he wrote uh, many books. And he published several besides Ben-Hur. And there are many pictures of him under that tree writing. Well, Lou Wallace, when he died, within the same week, lightning struck that tree and it is there no more. It's an amazing story. I would highly recommend the museum as a day trip. It's just a great place to visit. Lou Wallace can be summarized. His whole life was one of being self-taught. He dropped out of school at the age of eight. He taught himself to paint and became an accomplished oil painter and portrait artist. He became an accomplished writer, uh, Civil War general, all from being self-taught. He taught himself to play the violin so well that he could stop a crowd on the streets and gather hundreds of people to listen. He actually then went on to make his own violins, and that was also self-taught. He taught himself to um, do just about everything, including inventions such as a collapsible fishing pole that he invented long before there was anything such as the Popeil pocket fisherman. So his museum is full of these things. He was also a sculptor. He was uh, a man of so many talents. We would call him today a Renaissance man. So his motto as he went through life was, may a man tell what he can do until he tries. That, I take it, is the soul of Americanism. I think it's a fantastic motto. There have been uh, some suggestions that the new bridge over the Ohio should be named after the Black Brigade or perhaps after Lou Wallace. I can, uh, I would really support that. I would love to see that happen. Uh, and maybe this could be part of an inscription above the bridge that would just express what everything, everything that he stood for and that he created and left us this legacy of freedom, of idealism, of uh, inspiration. So Lou Wallace is the man who saved Cincinnati. Um, I put up um, my web address here where you can uh, take advantage of um, some discounts that I'm offering on all of my books. And um, I'd be glad to entertain questions of, uh, you know, any of the books and um, whatever uh, else you'd like to ask. Thank you so much, Peter, for such an excellent presentation. Thank you. Um, I do know that we did have some questions and comments, um, but first I'd like to go back to that trivia question we had at the beginning. Um, Heather, you wanna go ahead and read that trivia question again and, and let us know if we had a winner? Yeah, so it was, who was the doctor at Camp Denison in Cincinnati who became a household name in America and why? Um, and we had somebody get the name, the who, and somebody else get the why. So we have two winners. All um, right. And that was Frederick Warren and Richard M. So you guys will be getting your prizes in the mail and congratulations. Way to go, guys. Shall we give everybody the answer? Oh yeah, did you not? <laughs> yes, <laughs> what was the correct answer, Heather? Um, it was Dr. John Salisbury who invented the Salisbury steak. Exactly, and he did so why? because the Civil War soldiers had such poor uh, dental hygiene. Many of them, when they were recovering from their wounds, couldn't chew the steaks that were pretty, pretty tough in those days. And so he got this bright idea to grind the steak up and mix it with gravy and potatoes. And that was the invention of the Salisbury steak and it saved many of those veterans' lives. That's some interesting history. Well, congratulations to our winners. Um, yeah. Heather, you want to go ahead and what kind of questions do we have any on Facebook, first of all? 
Um, I do not know. We do not have any questions from Facebook. So we can go ahead and start with um, the questions on Zoom. And the first one is, and I know we answered it in the chat a bit, but it was, um, did the siege of Cincinnati ever happen? And that was, no, it is the siege that never occurred. But I don't know if you wanted to just expand upon that just a little bit more. Um, sure. The siege was lifted almost by um, an act of divine uh, intervention because that order that came with Henry Heath to bring him back uh, prevented what could have been uh, maybe as bad as something like Vicksburg. We know what happened with other cities that were under siege. Uh, Corinth, Mississippi is another example where there was the siege of Corinth and they quickly ran out of food, they ran out of drinking water to the point where men were drinking um, water from the tops of graves where they became severely sick. Hundreds and hundreds, even thousands died of dysentery, fever, um, just horrible diseases. And in Vicksburg, the citizens were under cannon fire for weeks and they retreated to live in caves. I mean, this is the kind of thing. Cincinnati is in those days, every every building was built from dry wood. Fires were a huge hazard. So Cincinnati could have been lost. It was very close thing. And I think she had some other questions that went along with that too, Heather. Yeah. So the next question was, where is the present site of the Burnett House? The Burnett House would have been right at the corner of, let's see, it would be 3rd Street and um, I think it's Race. It would be where the Olympic Park uh, parking lot is. And um, that's right behind the PNC building. So right at the third corner of 3rd Street and, and I think that's Race Street, that's where the Burnett House, which was huge. It was a, the, one of the, the greatest hotels in the country, not just the Midwest. And that was where all the um, well-known celebrities who visited Cincinnati, the sixth largest city, uh, would come to stay. And it was first class all the way. Nice. Um, and then I think the third question that um, went with that was, what did it mean when someone was a copperhead? Um, a copperhead was a derogatory term that was used to describe people whose sympathies were more Southern than Northern. Now that could have been some that supported the slave economy because many people in Cincinnati, um, they lost their livelihoods and their, their, their bank accounts because when the war came, they could no longer do commerce with the slave states. So the, city, the economy of Cincinnati almost collapsed. And those people wanted things to go back to normal and they cared a lot less about slavery than they did about their own uh, income. Those were copperheads. Others were people who hated Lincoln. Lincoln was extremely unpopular. He won by only about 39% of the vote nationally in a race of among four people. He only got 1% of the vote in his home state where he was born in Kentucky. So a lot of people just hated Abraham Lincoln. He was an outsider. He was seen as a bumpkin. He was stirring things up and, and tearing the union apart. So there were lots of people who were copperheads and uh, a lot of them were all around Cincinnati and in uh, Dayton especially and in Southern India. Um, and then someone just asked, where was Camp Denison? Camp Denison is just south of Indian Hill in Cincinnati. Um, there was a railroad line that, that still runs there. That was the Little Miami Railway. And um, it's right near Miamiville which is where there is a, um, a famous shootout between the troops stationed at Camp Denison and Morgan's Raiders, who came through the following summer and um, rode right through Camp Denison, which I think they were doing that deliberately because their whole goal was to draw troops away from the battles that were being fought in the South. But uh, they had this big shootout, and a fireman on one of the railroad cars was killed there. And to this day, people claim that that area is still haunted by his ghost. We do know that Morgan continued riding through there, and he told the people that he uh, fought with that um, if you don't give him a Christian burial, when he lost one of his soldiers, he said, I'll be back to bury the rest of you. So uh, he was a very scary guy. And uh, quite a, quite a, to the South, he was a dashing hero. 
to the north, he was a terrorist. So. And um, somebody else wanted to know, um, isn't Burnett House where Sherman and Grant met to plan the Civil War battles? Yes, they did. And there is also, that's a great story. Plus, if, you, um, if you're ever in the uh, Queen City Club, uh, go to the second floor, and there is a famous picture of Sherman there, of, an oil painting. It's a fantastic oil painting of Sherman. And I think I was told that that was painted while he was in town for those meetings. And it's so lifelike, it's really almost scary. Also, after the war, a couple of years later, uh, one of the things that's remarkable about learning about these men who fought the Civil War is how fast they were able to lay aside their hostilities and become friends again to reunite the country. Well, after the war, by sheer happenstance, Lou Wallace is visiting town at the Burnett House, and he finds out that Henry Heath is in the same hotel. They got together for a couple of drinks, and uh, they shared their their view of what happened at the siege of Cincinnati. And that story is in my book, and it's really fantastic. Uh, it just it's so fun. I can't even. I wanted to imagine that that happened, but it really did. Um, and then the last question we have is, what ended up happening to the Confederate spy that was connected to Ambrose Burnside um, and asked if it was post-house arrest? Um, she was under house arrest uh, for some indefinite period. The, the history is kind of hazy. She and her sister, Ginny, uh, were smuggling opium and morphine and uh, like dry goods cloth uh, dressmaking materials to the South because they needed bandages and they needed anesthetic desperately. And she was actually taking them to Kirby Smith. Anyway, so she was caught by Burnside, put under house arrest. And then after the war, she was uh, finally did get married by the man with the, the pistol in his pocket who told her she could choose between a funeral and a wedding. And she chose wisely. So she, she lived long after that. In fact, her house, the Moon House, is a national historic site in Oxford, Ohio. So that's also worth the visit. Well, very, very cool information. Um, thank you so much for such a great presentation. I mean, we've got some great comments too as well in here in the chat. Good. Again, where is it that um, folks can find your books if they wanted to buy your, your books? Um, you can find it at all of the uh, major bookstores in town, the, the chain bookstores, Joseph F. especially, um, Roebling Point Books in um, Northern Kentucky, uh, all of these stock it. Also, you can get it on Amazon, but I recommend if you want a signed copy, go to my website, which is chilidogpress.com, easy to remember, and you'll find some specials there also. So you can buy the whole package, you can buy two, one, whatever you like, and I'd be glad to sign it. Wonderful. Thanks again, Peter. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. Now, as we wrap up, we do have a lot of fun promotions going on at the museum. So, Heather, if you want to go ahead and get that pulled up. Um, we still do have our veranda closed at the moment. So um, we're still offering half price admission through April 5th um, because we're preparing for a new exhibit. But there's lots of new things to see. We have a small World War I exhibit on the first floor, as well as a Barbie exhibit that includes dolls, accessories, and memorabilia on the second and third floors. This also includes a life-sized pink obsessed Barbie box selfie station. So we invite you to celebrate Barbie's 65th birthday with us. So come and check it out. While visiting the museum, be sure to get a Barbie raffle ticket because then you'll have a chance to win either a 1999 Spring Collection Spring in Tokyo Barbie or a 1998 Avon exclusive Winter Splen Splendor Barbie. Tickets are just $5 a piece and then we'll have that drawing in August. And Race to Fame, Hometown Kentucky Derby Legends opens this Saturday on April 6th. You'll see silk, saddles, helmets, and other accoutrements from esteemed jockeys such as Kentucky Derby winners Eddie Arcaro and Mac Garner. The exhibit also tells the stories of the horse owners, the breeders, and trainers from our area, illuminating their pivotal roles in shaping the sport of horse racing. There are still spots available for BCM's summer camp under the Sea Adventure Camp. This camp's for kids entering second through fifth grade to explore the wonders of the oceans and beaches and the animals that live there. 
Um, and if you are a non-member, the fee includes a free family membership good for a year from the date purchase. So it's a really great deal. So I encourage you to sign up for that. You can contact Ms. Kim at education at bcmuseum.org for that. And music at BCM is just around the corner. We're excited to kick the summer concert series off this year with local favorites, the Turkeys, on Thursday, June 6th. So stay tuned for the complete concert schedule coming soon. You might have seen on social media today that Chip Polston of KET Kentucky Life shared a short video highlight at the museum for an upcoming show. Please tune in to KET on Saturday, April 6th at 8 p.m. to see more of that interview that Chip had with our curator of collections, Jason French. We're really excited about that. Our next Northern Kentucky History Hour is going to be on April 16th with Captain Don Sanders. He'll be sharing his life stories in From River Rat to Steamboatman. And then we have Marty Shadler on April 30th with Pride in the Skies, Northern Kentuckians in the Kentucky Aviation Hall of Fame. So please be sure to tune in to those. And for more Northern Kentucky history throughout the week, check out our Facebook page and our YouTube channel where you can find the latest Curators Chat, along with all of our past Northern Kentucky History Hour presentations. Please like and subscribe. That's all that we have time for this evening. So thank you again to all of our sponsors and supporters of BCM. Until next time, take care, everyone, and good night. Thanks again, Peter.